Hi YouTube, it's Joshua Miles and welcome back to my channel. Today's video is going to be yet another solved case in my Curious Case series. I'm going to be posting two videos a week over the coming months, so prepare yourself for a lot of true crime content coming your way. And prepare yourself for a bunch of unknown cases. If you have any suggestions for any cases that you want me to cover, then you can go over to requestacase.com and send in your submissions there. The case we're going to be talking about today is actually a case submission from one of you, so thank you so much for sending this case in. I will be doing the polls for the next community voted case uh, over on my Instagram, so if you want to go take part in that, then jump over to Instagram, search up It's Joshua Miles and hit that follow so that you can take part when that happens. And what the community voted poll is, is where I will be asking for cases from you, picking the most popular, most requested from all those cases, Cases, then putting them in a poll and you guys will get to vote. I also now have a brand new newsletter so that you can be notified whenever I post a brand new video or if I have an announcement or for any super secret stuff for you newsletter members that you can go sign up for at itsjoshuamiles.com. Uh, I send out an email when I post a new video, a new podcast, you know, special announcements, things like that. And I set that up just because I know that YouTube isn't always the best at letting you guys know when I've been posting posting or announcing something, so I thought I'd create something so that you guys wouldn't miss out. I'd just like to point out this video has not been made because disrespect or anything like that, it's just been made to spread awareness about this case by compiling information from various different public sources on the internet. Any theories discussed in this video are just that, they are theories, they're not facts, they shouldn't be taken as such. Any views, opinions or theories discussed in this video do not represent the views of myself, law enforcement or anybody involved in this case unless otherwise stated. And with all that being said, let's delve right into this case. Monday the 23rd of March 1987 was a day that would bring endless joy to the Val family as they welcomed a newborn girl into the world. However, just 30 years later, the Val family would suffer a day that would bring endless grief and pain pain that they still feel to this day. Kim Isabel Frederica Val was the newborn girl that the Val family had welcomed into the world in 1987, and she was born in Trelleborg, Sweden. Not long after her birth, Kim's parents welcomed another newborn child into the world, who Kim's parents named Tom. On all accounts, Kim had a fairly regular childhood uh, with nothing notable occurring, and she actually attended school 35 minutes away from her hometown in a city called Malmö, I believe it's pronounced. I couldn't quite pinpoint whether this young family had moved to Malmö shortly after the birth of Kim and her younger brother Tom, or whether the family still lived in their hometown and they just made the daily commute to school. Such a long commute, such as that 35 minute drive to school, wouldn't be unheard of. I know from personal experience that my two younger brothers actually make a 40 minute commute from my house to their school every morning and evening. So it's not something that is a rare event to occur, at least in Europe. Whatever the case, Kim graduated from high school and moved to London to start her bachelor's degree at the London School of Economics. Now, the London School of Economics is a public research university that is actually a part of the University of London. The school has just over 11,000 students, and Kim was beyond excited to be a part of the school's population. Kim was very successful in her degree and always achieved top marks. Upon completion and graduation of her bachelor's degree in international relations in 2011, I believe, Kim realized that she actually had a passion for journalism and that she wanted to explore that passion as part of her dual master's degree. Sure, 
Shortly after graduating, Kim moved to New York City to study her dual master's degree in international relations and journalism at Columbia University. Living and studying in New York City was somewhat of a dream for Kim, and her experiences there further ignited her passions for journalism. During her time at Columbia University, Kim also began to start learning Mandarin. She also actually received a scholarship from the Sweden America Foundation, which is a notoriously difficult scholarship to obtain. To qualify, you must be extremely talented at what you do and have top grades. This just goes to show Kim's determined character, her high level of talent, and her academic success. Upon graduation from Columbia University, Kim began what would become a very successful career in freelance journalism. She wrote articles for numerous reputable and noteworthy publications, such as Harper's, The Guardian, New York Times, Foreign Policy, Vice Magazine, Slate, South China Morning Post, The Atlantic, Rodan Kingdoms, Thai Magazines. There are so many publications that her work was featured in that is just scratching the surface. All those publications just go further to show how talented she was in journalism and how successful she was in her field. Most notably, in 2013, according to her website, Kim reported from post-war Sri Lanka. Following that, she was a United Nations Foundation Press Fellow in 2014 and 2015. She reported on the tourism industry in post-earthquake Haiti in 2015, and in the following year, in 2016, she researched Cuba's tech scene, explored a Chinatown in Uganda, and then she returned back to Sri Lanka to write about feminism in guerrilla warfare. In 2016, she was also awarded with the Hansel Myth Prize for Best Digital Reportage for her reporting on climate change and nuclear testing in the Marshall Islands. Interesting to note, during her reporting on on the Marshall Islands, she was actually quarantined and examined for potential radiation exposure. Kim was a passionate journalist who covered topics that were socially important and socially aware, oftentimes exploring hard-hitting topics in dangerous locations. She received a lot of recognition for her work and lived in a wide variety of places, including New York City and also in China. Her education in the language of Mandarin came in really useful when she was working in China. That was until 2017, shortly before Kim's 30th birthday. She decided that she wanted to do an article about a submarine and the submarine's owner in Copenhagen, Denmark, which is where she lived at the time. Copenhagen was less than 50 kilometers from her hometown in Sweden, and it felt, especially compared to all the places she had reported from before, like an entirely safe place to be. However, in a tale that would make international headlines, Kim would step foot on this submarine, submerge, and never resurface alive again. According to the NZ Herald, Kim was working on a story about a Danish inventor who was called Peter Madsen, who was a very popular and well-known figure in Denmark for using crowdfunding to build submarines and rockets. But who really was Peter Madsen? Peter was born on the 12th of January 1971 in Denmark, and according to some sources, his father had actually been abusive to three of his step-siblings. I don't believe his father had ever been abusive towards him, though. His parents separated when Peter was just six years old, and initially, Peter went to go live with his mother, However, after a short while, he decided that he wanted to go live with his father, as him and his father actually shared a common interest space and rockets. It was during his teen years that Peter developed his almost obsessive interest in rockets. He actually developed his first rocket when he was just 15 years old, and he launched it on the 3rd of March 1986. The rocket itself was just one meter tall, and he had built it in his father's workshop. Upon launching, the rocket reached a height of 100 meters before falling back to Earth in a controlled fashion, not harming anybody. The next year, in 1987, Peter was accepted into an upper secondary school that was a few towns over. And subsequently, Peter actually moved out and moved into a youth house in the town so he could be closer to the school. However, sadly, in 1990, just before Peter's 19th birthday, 
his father passed away. But this tragic event didn't dissuade Peter from continuing his research in rockets. He even began to experiment further and consult qualified engineers who were working in the field. It didn't take long for Peter to become really good friends with the family that ran the fireworks show in Copenhagen. And I believe he learned a lot from this family about rockets and he experimented still um, with his own rockets using what he learned from this family. He also joined Copenhagen's Rocket Club, where he gained a reputation for setting things on fire and setting off the fire sprinkler system, with one member telling the press that just mentioning his name would start the sprinklers. Interestingly to note, Peter never actually completed any of his formal education. He did, according to some sources, enroll in courses relating to engineering and welding, which he then used to further expand his knowledge and his understanding of how rockets are made. His massive passion and interest actually drew the attention of a wide number of people, organizations and enterprises that saw talent in him. And it was through this interest that Peter had that people began to start funding his projects. Peter would go on to launch three major projects his projects with submarines, a project called Copenhagen Suborbitals, and a project called the Rocket Madsen Space Lab. Though for the purpose of this video, we're going to be focusing primarily on his submarine projects. Peter built three submarines in this project, UC-1 Freya, UC-2 Cracker, and UC-3 Nautilus. And it was UC-3 Nautilus that gained the interest and attention from Kim Val. According to the UC-3 Nautilus Wikipedia page, the Nautilus was a privately owned Danish midget submarine. A midget submarine is any submarine that is under 150 tons and is typically operated by a crew of one or two people with little to no onboard living accommodation. The Nautilus was built over a three year period between 2005 and 2008 by Peter and a group of volunteers. The midget submarine cost around 200,000 US dollars to build and was actually the third iteration in Peter's designs for submarines. It was launched on the 3rd of May 2008 and weighed just 32 tons. On its launch day, however, the submarine was actually incomplete and over the course of the next few months, Peter and the group of volunteers who he worked with installed further equipment inside the submarine. The Nautilus then first submerged in October of 2008. It was used primarily just for recreational expeditions but noted was used to push the launch platform Sputnik as part of the Copenhagen Suborbitals project that Peter was also a part of. However, in 2011, the submarine was taken out of the water and was brought back into the workshop so that upgrades could be carried out on it. It actually took six years for the submarine to then be relaunched, relaunching on the 28th of April 2017, just five months prior to Kim Val boarding it. Let's talk about what happened on that fateful Thursday the 10th of August 2017. According to some sources, Kim Val and her boyfriend had planned a farewell party for that evening, as they were actually moving to China just a few days later on the 16th. But just before this party was due to take place, Kim actually received a text message from Peter. Kim had actually tried to contact Peter several times prior to receiving this text message in an attempt to interview him for her article. She wanted to interview him about his submarine and his life story, and she thought it'd be interesting and fun if the interview could take place on the submarine. When Peter texts Kim, inviting her to come on the submarine to conduct her interview, she was beyond ecstatic. This would mean that her final piece in Denmark that she would work on would be a really interesting and fun piece about a privately owned submarine. And it was an article about a very well-known and notable Denmark inventor. Peter told Kim to meet him at 7 p.m. in Copenhagen's harbor, where Peter would bring Kim on board the submarine and where they would conduct their interview. Kim's boyfriend was actually quite jealous that Kim had this opportunity to go on a submarine because it wasn't an opportunity that often arose for a 
general member of the public. It's not often that someone gets to go on a submarine if you're not part of the Navy or if you've not got millions and millions to throw around to buy a submarine. Kim's boyfriend actually told Kim that he wished that he could go on the submarine with her. However, he couldn't because he had to stay back and stay at the house because they had guests coming over for this farewell party and he had to greet them and explain what Kim was doing. After all, Kim would only be about two hours before she would return and rejoin the party. Or so Kim's boyfriend thought. There are actually a few photographs of Kim and Peter on the submarine in the harbour and I believe these photographs were taken by Kim's boyfriend before he returned back to their home. These photographs, knowing the context, are quite chilling and are some of the last known photographs of Kim Val alive. However, when Kim's boyfriend went down to the Copenhagen Harbour at 9pm to pick up Kim, Kim was nowhere to be seen, and even more importantly, the submarine was nowhere to be seen. Kim's boyfriend decided that maybe they took a detour, or maybe the interview was going on for longer than they had thought or estimated, or they were just taking their time. But after all, Kim would be unable to text her boyfriend because there's no service underwater and the only way that she could text him would be if the submarine surfaced. So Kim's boyfriend's only option was to wait at the harbour for them to get back uh, so that he could take them to the party. Though those minutes of waiting quickly turned into hours. At 1.43am, almost five hours after last seeing Kim, Kim's boyfriend phoned the authorities and reported Kim and the vessel as missing. Reports of the missing vessel were sent out to all neighbouring docks, ships and marine centres. As it turns out, a passing ship just so happened to capture this photograph of the submarine at around 8.30pm. As you can see, nothing seems amiss in the picture and this would have just been about half an hour before they were due to go back to the harbour. This is the last picture of Kim alive. Then at midnight, a merchant ship had actually seen the submarine northwest of the Orsund Bridge. When Kim's boyfriend's missing report came in, the authorities were quick to launch massive search parties, including the use of helicopters and other ships in the area to try and locate the missing vessel, fearing that it had suffered some kind of an accident. On the 11th of August, the day after Kim had set foot on the submarine, a report came in from a lighthouse, and this lighthouse claimed to have seen a submarine surface at about 10.30 a.m. Just half an hour later, at 11 a.m., the submarine would resurface and then begin to sink. And this sinking was allegedly due to a faulty ballast tank. Thankfully, a rescue helicopter had been able to radio the submarine while it had been surfaced, and confirms that it was the submarine that Peter owned, confirmed that Peter was on the submarine. And it was during this radio call that Peter informed the rescue helicopter that his submarine was sinking. A private boat rushed to rescue Peter from the sinking submarine and to rescue any of the other occupants. However, they only ever managed to pull out Peter from the water. It's important to note that Peter had actually swam from the submarine towards the boat. Peter, when he was was brought back to the shore, was immediately arrested and was actually charged with involuntary manslaughter for accidentally killing Kim Val. However, no body of Kim had actually been recovered by this point, so there was no evidence to even say that Kim had passed away. There's no proof to say that Kim had even perished. The next day, on the Saturday, the authorities lifted the submarine, which had submerged to seven meters below sea level, out of the water so that they could inspect it and for forensically examine it. The investigating officers quickly determined that there was nobody else on board, dead or alive, meaning that Kim hadn't potentially perished uh, by drowning as the submarine sank. Now, when asked by the police where Kim was, Peter claims to have actually dropped Kim off at a restaurant. And he claims to have dropped Kim off near a restaurant near the northern tip of, I don't know how you pronounce it, so I'm just gonna put it on the screen. Dropping her off late Thursday night at, he says, about 10 p.m. Just to point out, if Peter's story is true in this instance, that means that Kim had either had her phone run out of power or that she was purposefully ignoring the countless texts that were coming in from her worried boyfriend and by that point worried family and friends. The owner of the restaurant where Peter claimed to have dropped 
Kim off, came forward to the police with all the CCTV footage from all of the cameras in the area. The area where she was allegedly dropped off was heavily, heavily surveillance by CCTV. There were actually witnesses to the submarine surfacing shortly before it began to sink. And what these witnesses say is quite interesting. These witnesses gave statements to say that Peter had acted extremely calm while this, while his submarine was sinking and that he didn't seem to be panicking at all as if he knew what was happening and wasn't surprised by the fact the submarine had suddenly started ship sinking and wasn't really, and he was at peace at the idea of his submarine sinking. Bear in mind, this would have been a passion project that would cost hundreds of thousands of dollars to build he didn't really seem too phased by it. One of the key witnesses said, there was some kind of airflow coming up and the submarine started to sink. Peter stayed in the tower until water began pouring into it. As the submarine sank, he swam to a nearby boat. However, Peter's tale of what actually happened that night quickly began to change. On the 12th of August, after a judicial hearing, the police told the media that Peter had actually changed his story about what had happened that night, but the police at this point didn't tell the media much else besides that. In this new version of events, there had been some kind of a terrible accident on board the submarine. Kim had apparently been coming through the heavy 70 kilogram hatch to the submarine, coming into the submarine, and somehow had knocked the hatch, which had then fallen fallen onto her, crushing her head. After which, Peter told the police he decided that he would dump her body offshore in some kind of water ocean funeral. Police from the offset believes that Peter intentionally sunk his submarine in an attempt to cover his tracks. They were very, very suspicious of Peter, especially when you counter in the facts that the CCTV evidence of the surrounding area where she had alleg allegedly been dropped off, that had no, um, no sighting, no sighting of Kim. And then he changes his story and now she's accidentally died and she, he's got rid of the body. Like, who does that? Why wouldn't you just come back to the shore and like call an ambulance, call an air ambulance? There's so many things that a uh, normal person would do in that situation and so many things that made the police very suspicious of Peter in this case. As you can see on this map, I've laid out the key locations of sightings of the submarine and the subsequent location of the sinking. So just so you can get a picture of where the submarine actually went that night and then the following morning. Of course, we don't actually know where the submarine actually went for certain as it didn't have tracking devices on board. Usually on a submarine, a GPS system would be used to give an accurate location as to the whereabouts of the vessel. Alongside the GPS, a system called NAVSAT may also be typically used. However, this system is owned and used by the US Navy and wouldn't obviously be used in this instance in a Denmark submarine. Submarines also often use radar and sonar in friendly waters as the frequencies emitted by those two systems are actually easily detectable. So they only use that in friendly waters and not in dangerous waters. The midget submarine that Peter owned didn't have any trackable devices on it at all and just had a GPS system which would be used to navigate the vessel. Interestingly to point out, a civilian owned submarine is typically called a submersible, but the UC3 Nautilus had actually been used by the Royal Danish Navy Submarine Division, which is now not an existent division, um, for a short period, which is why it had the name of a submarine and not a submersible. It's because it had been used for a brief stint by the Navy. On the 21st of August 2017, a member of the public who was cycling along a beach discovered the washed up remains of a human torso. The torso had been dismembered and was naked. Investigators were quick to recover the remains and bring it in for medical investigation and examination. In a post-mortem, the medical examiners determined that the torso had suffered 15 stab wounds, most of the wounds being concentrated in the groin area. As per usual, I'm not going to discuss the vivid details of what actually occurred um, to the remains, just out of respect and because I just don't think it's that necessary to discuss. In the subsequent weeks that followed, a police diving team alongside police dogs actually recovered more parts. They recovered two plastic bags that contained the majority of the rest of the remains, 
uh, some clothing and a knife. The plastic bags had actually been weighed down by heavy objects such as pieces of metal and car car exhaust pipes. The police then later discovered a saw followed by the final remains uh, in the ocean. The body was successfully and sadly identified to be that of the missing 30-year-old reporter Kim Val. Peter Madsen was subsequently charged with the murder of Kim Val. Peter's electronics were then seized so that they could be examined, including his mobile phone and his laptop. Technological forensic experts discovered videos on Peter's devices that depicted decapitation and adult films of people practicing asphyxiation sex. It was even determined that shortly before Kim boarded Peter's submarine, Peter had actually watched a beheading video on his phone. Now on the 30th of October 2017, Peter actually changed his story for the third time. This time, he claims that Kim had actually succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning while he was on the upper deck. According to the BBC, Peter claimed, the air pressure on board the submarine had suddenly plummeted while I was on the deck and Kim Val was in the engine room. The sub had begun to fill with exhaust fumes and I had been unable to get back in. When I finally managed to open the hatch, a warm cloud hit my face. I found her lifeless body on the floor. I then squatted next to her and tried to wake her up, slapping her cheeks. After trying for almost an hour to push her body out of the submarine, Peter claimed to then have mutilated her. Peter then went on to claim in his trial that he had concealed the truth out of respect to Kim's family. However, the prosecutors in this case categorically reject Peter's statements and Peter's uh, testimony and believe that he's just making all this up in an attempt to avoid any severe prosecution. Peter's defense then argues that there was no concrete evidence to support the contrary. Any key forensic evidence was actually destroyed when Peter had intentionally sunk his submarine. Or so Peter thought. According to some sources, forensics were able to recover a very, very tiny amount of blood from the inside of the submarine blood which was then compared to the DNA of Kim and was then confirmed to be her blood. The prosecution during the trial knew that they had a very, very tough time in finding the adequate justice for Kim and Kim's family. The prosecution told the court of how Peter enjoyed to watch these violent beheading videos and enjoyed watching these adults asphyxiation sex movies. And they used the results of the post-mortem to paint the picture that it had been a clearly intentional, sexually motivated attack. This was due to the sheer amount of stab wounds concentrated in the groin area. Further to this, the prosecution actually presented to the court other witnesses, all of whom were women that Peter had actually contacted and tried to get to board his submarine in the same week that Kim passed away. All of them actually turned down his offers, with Kim being the only person to take him up on the offer. A decision that would seal Kim's fate. According to some sources, Peter had actually been seen taking a screwdriver, a saw, and some car pipes into the submarine on the 10th of August. The prosecution then used this information to present the fact that the murder had been premeditated. They presented a case of premeditated murder, mishandling of a corpse, and sexual assault. An expert witness was also brought in by the prosecution to discuss the likelihood of Peter's version of events, the carbon monoxide theory. However, this expert told the court that there would be a possibility of Kim succumbing to carbon monoxide poisoning, inside the submarine, but only if the submarine had reached incredibly hot temperatures inside. Following that testimony, a police witness then took the stand and told the court of how there had been no signs of exhaust or fumes inside the submarine. Subsequently, on the 25th of April 2018, Peter Madsen was charged on all counts and sentenced to life 
imprisonment. And that was on the charges of premeditated murder, indecent handling of a corpse, and sexual assault. It is important to note, however, that a life sentence and life imprisonment in Denmark is actually of an indeterminate length, which means it can go on forever until death. But somebody who is sentenced to life imprisonment in Denmark can actually uh, become eligible for a pardon hearing after 12 years have been served. According to some sources, the average life sentence in Denmark is just 17 years. There are currently only four people today in Denmark who have served more than 30 years of their life sentence. Peter Madsen will be eligible for a pardoning hearing in 2030. In remembrance of Kim, a grant called the Kim Val Memorial Fund was set up by her family and friends, and this was set up to honor her legacy. According to the fund's website, Kim wanted more women to be out in the world, brushing up against life, and we would like to help bend the world in her vision. This fund will fund a female reporter to cover subculture, broadly defined, and what Kim liked to call the undercurrents of rebellion. Several donations to the fund has allowed the grant to be given to a female reporter in 2018. But in 2019, there were so many donations that the fund were able to select more than one winner for the grant. So in 2019, the winners of the grant were two female upcoming reporters, one from Portugal and the other from the United States, followed by a honorable mention of a female reporter from Pakistan. It's amazing to see such a positive and helpful fund come out of such a tragic and heartbreaking event. And that's everything that I have for you in today's case. Thank you so much for watching this episode in my Curious Case series. If you want to watch more cases just like this, then you can find a link to my Curious Case series playlist in the description down below. If you love true crime podcasts, then be sure to listen to my true crime podcast, Crime Time, which you can find on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Google Podcasts, anywhere you can usually find podcasts, or you can go to thecrimetimepodcast.com and listen over there. Don't forget to follow me on Instagram and Twitter and to subscribe to this channel if you want to see more true crime content and hit that bell icon so you can be notified every single time that I post. All my sources have been linked down below including information for relevant charities and organizations across the world if you've been affected by any of the topics discussed in today's videos. You can also find links to everything that I'm working on on my projects and everything like that in the description and with all that being said I'll see you in the next case. Now the